right. right? OK. So you want to work with Bazel, but you don't do monorepo. Now, if you're using Bazel in a monorepo, it might not seem clear what is the relation. And if you're not using Bazel yet, then it also might not seem clear. But if you are using Bazel in a many repo setting, you know this opens up uh, a can of worms, which we're trying to solve, and so on and so on. But it's not that easy. In this talk, whoop, yes, I'll talk about how we got many repos to work with head dependency and be reproducible. So first, uh, my name is Itai Zeidman. I'm back in the engineering lead at Wix.com. I love unblocking developers. Previously, I was uh, the server infra team leader. I founded the team. Over the past two years, I've been building our next generation build system, dreaming it, envisioning it, designing, uh, talking with, with Googlers, uh, encoding it. Um, I'm a co-maintainer of Rule Scala and a co-maintainer of base integration testing, which is a library that enables you to run basically test Bazel inside of Bazel. So if you have Starlock plugins that you want to run negative tests, go check it out. We don't have any documentation, but uh, we do have we do have uh, code, uh, some Python, some Go, and Java. So uh, take a look. And lastly, uh, I'm the proud spouse and father of three amazing daughters. So Wix. Wix is an online uh, website building platform. We have 130 million website builders, 600 million uh, monthly visitors, 2,000 employees on 50% in the R&D, multi-cloud, multi-data center, of course. Part of it is on GCP. Uh, over 800 different microservices and over 300 daily deployments to production. Our CI system. We have thousands of build configurations and every module is a build. We have services that basically automatically uh, discover when you add a new Palm XML or a new package JSON and then they add it automatically to the build server and they run it through matrix multiplications to find the shortest path to add the shortest triggers. Uh, we use same version uh, which is floating, so it's snapshot on Maven and latest on NPM. I have more than 50,000 build runs a day on master and millions of test runs on, on the master. And, you know, this, this is not as impressive as the stats we saw this morning, uh, but still we stress out our system. Uh, we have 15 microservices just in the CI using Kafka to facilitate all of that and still we brought it to its knees. So we needed to build a new system, and that's what we've been hard at work. This, these are just some of the things that we needed to solve, and um, today we'll focus on second party, but essentially moving, uh, trying to get the next scale, is uh, it, there are a lot of different fronts that you need to attack. OK. so. Um, so I, I, I talked about a few different terms. I said uh, many repo, head dependency, uh, and reproducible, and that might, might sound like Greek to some of you. So don't worry, we'll dive into the terms right now. So monorepo, what's a monorepo? It's putting all of the organization's source code into a single repository, right? Git, SVN, Mercurial, okay. Now, we know that all of the cool kids are doing it, right? On Google and Facebook and Twitter and Uber and Yandex. Why, why, why not do a monorepo? So first, what, what's a many repo? Many repo is when you put your organization's code in many repositories, right? Sounds simple. So why? Um, so a monorepo is hard to maintain at scale. Like I said, we have around 1,000 people in the R&D. We have uh, many commits per minute. Uh, in, in, in working hours. Now, what do I mean by scale and hard? So Git server does not scale very well with the number of refs and number of packs. But you might say, hey, we heard that Google actually have a service, right, CSR, that uses Git on Borg, and that solves the, the so Git server scale. Indeed, but it doesn't serve, solve the Git client scale issues. So just for example, we took all of our code and with the refs and packs, of course, and put it in one uh, Git repo locally, and simple operations like git status and git stash took many, many minutes. I don't want to even tell you, but many, much more than 10 minutes. So and nothing currently solves git client, right? But you might have heard that GVFS and Eden and uh, Twitter have a solution for git, right? And Mercurial also solves this problem at scale. That's true. but. Uh, None of these solutions are 100% there. 
Now, um, I have to say that I think that in a year to two years' time, this will be a solved problem. And the entry, uh, the barrier entry to using a one repo at scale will be accessible to m many more companies. But for now, this isn't really um, a solved problem. If you want to talk uh, and hear a bit more about the details, then I'd be happy to talk to you offline afterwards. OK, so we said many repo want a repo. What's second party? So second party is code that your organization owns, but you do not operate or maintain. So it can be a shared library. It can be an API, right? This, this is as opposed to third party code that your organization does not own and maintain, and um, opposed to first party code that you actually maintain. So what's second party head dependency? This is having uh, a shared version, which is relatively up to date, that everyone in the organization is using. Right? It can be just using a global version, but this means that everyone is using the same version of the code. Why would you want to do that? So first, because you want to mi minimize the number of code paths needed for backward compatibility. If I need to maintain a library that supports uh, clients from five versions, three versions, and the latest version, I have, much, I have many more code paths that I need to uh, take into account whenever I do a code change. Additionally, we want to find integration issues earlier. So <clears throat> for example, let's say I'm, I'm now a library a user, and I'm using version 5, and I'm very, very happy. But then I find that version 10 actually has a critical bug fix. I want to upgrade, but then I find that version 8 introduce an incompatible change. Now, some months after this incompatible change, I'm now stuck. So either the library maintainer has to do like a version 11 with some kind of hack to, to allow version 8, you know, because this is an organization and we work for the same cause, or I need to somehow swallow the version 8 change even though I did not prepare for it. If we were at head dependency, we've, we've found that out much earlier, right? Once that commit was pushed, the library maintainer would, found, would have found out that they broke me, and we, then we would have the discussion. Additionally, you want to increase the usage of shared code and minimize repetition. Now, you might think, how is that related to head dependency? So first, if I can just use all of the organization's code without uh, worrying about OK, do, do I have access to that feature? Do I need to upgrade maybe? This is just accessible to me. Then I'm more likely to use it. Additionally, if, if you think about the use case from before, what people might often do is they might just fork out. At, they would say, you know what? I'll take the, the, the code that I was using. I'll just cherry pick version 10. And I'll sometime, at some time, I will do the, the version 8 upgrade. And then we have repetition. OK, so reproducible. I'm guessing that reproducible is, is pretty clear to this crowd. But still, let's agree that reproducible means that I can run the build again. And if the inputs have not changed, then the outputs will be the same. Why would you want to do that? So first, it allows us to debug production. We can just build whatever is on production again and uh, be able to stress that and see what's happening there. It allows us to debug a specific CI build. So if you, if you think something is flaky, we can rerun that and see exactly what's happening. And it allows us to stabilize the developer's feedback loop. So for example, if they're, um, if they're actually working on a short-lived branch and they just want to see that their code has changed, they don't want to see other things that are thrashing currently in the organization's code, if they have reproducibility, they can get the feedback for what they're doing. OK. So do head dependency and reproducible go together? So if you're using a monorepo, we're all good, right? Because the identifier of, let's say, git is the reproduce key. So you just have the, the identifier, and the, you get head dependency because everything is the same code. And you check it out, and you run, run the build, and everything is OK assuming that you have correct rule sets and so on and so on, right? OK. So if you use versioning and main repo and reproducible, we're also good. Because you can take a specific repo, take that commit, and inside of it, everything is versioned. So it's still reproducible, right? The dependencies are just versioned. If you want to say, you know what? 
Let's relax the reproducibility. Let's say many repo head dependency and unreproducible also works. You just resolve every build, you resolve the latest version, and you get head dependency. But many repo head, head dependency plus reproducible don't mix that well. I'll tell you a story that uh, how I came to realize that. So we, we were building, like I said, you know, built big system, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, challenges. And we were saying, you know what? No problem. We will just have the commits in the, in the workspace file uh, of, of the other repositories, and we will update them automatically whenever a commit happens. And we're like, yeah, this will work. And we were uh, doing a design meeting a good few months ago, saying, OK, let's, let's understand the details. Let's see that we have this working. And we start to say, you know what? We're not sure this actually works. Because, um, because actually, we'll have race conditions. What if two repositories actually now updated, and now they need to go and update the third one with the pointers? What will happen? Um, you also ha might have infinite loops of, I updated your repo for the pointers. Now this triggers everyone else to also update. So you somehow need to break the loop, right? Not rocket science, but still more and more complexity. But definitely the first part of the race conditions of seeing how we can have every repo, and again, think about many commits streaming in, and we need to, to, to update all of the pointer files in all of the repos to get the head dependency. And uh, I remember I was sitting in the meeting, and my colleagues were looking at me, and I felt the wind got knocked out of me. So I was just. You know, sitting there, I wasn't clear on how we're going to proceed. I'm saying, like, I've been building this system for a, more than a year, and maybe, may, may, maybe it's lost. Yeah, may, maybe there's nothing to do. And uh, for two days, I was walking around trying to think what to do, and I, I went to my manager. I told him, we have to talk. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Like, let's talk. And he, he listened, and then he told me, you know what? Can we uh, somehow reprodu uh, um, like just relax reproducibility? I know it's basal and so on, so on, but can we relax reproducibility and get many repo plus head dependency? Let's solve that later on. And I was like, you know what? I don't know, but it's worth a shot. So let me try that out. And this was our first uh, step in our journey to get many repos with head dependency and be reproducible at the end. So what did we do? Uh, our initial implementation actually heavily relied on a feature of Bazel that you might know, that when the user calls Bazel, it doesn't actually run Bazel. It runs a script that the script takes a look at the tools, at your workspace tools Bazel. If there's a script there, it will run it. If not, it will run Bazel real. And your script can also call, call Bazel real. What do, what do we use it for? So we have a wrapper script there. The script gets a list of repos in Wix world. It fetches the head commit with git ls remote, writes git repository instances in BZL, and then uh, that BZL is loaded in the workspace file. And later on, we call Bazel real. Now, the BZL is, of course, in git ignore because the versions keep on changing. And it's created only if it's not there. So you don't actually have to pay the, the, the cost every time. What are the pros? So first, it's simple, right? It's pretty simple. It was fast to get up and running. And it very much resembled workspace.resolved, which I think is now obsolete, right? I think it was changed dramatically. But back at the day, it was the thing to be. Workspace.resolved, it was very, very similar. We talked with Dimitri and said, you know what? This, this sounds like a good direction. What are the cons? So it introduced Voodoo, OK? What is that pointers file? What does it contain? When does it change? When you switch branches, what, what, what are the contents? Oh, you know what? Maybe try to delete the file. Let's see what happens. Now, maybe you know, a, a colleague tells you, hey, I need a, I need a help with, with my branch. You check it out. Nothing works because the branch is older. You delete the file, your file. You run it. Maybe it works. Then you can't come back to your file, right? Uh, uh, you have stale pointers because uh, maybe you run it, you run it now, and, and then you rebased a few hours later, and nothing works because the pointers have changed on master, but you still have an old file. And auditability, right? This is, ties into this. You don't know what you're running with on anywhere. Lastly, performance. 
So we're doing the Git LS remote. This is concurrently, but still, uh, it, 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 it took, took a fair amount. OK, so we, we, need, we understood that we need to go back to a drawing board. And the key thing is to track branches separately, because we want to enable people to switch branches and uh, to be able to know what's actually going on um, with what they're working on. So we said, you know what? Let's build a custom microservice. And that will just hold all of the versions, right? So basically, that script will tell it, hey, this is a repo I'm on, this is a branch, and it will get all of the pointers that the branch is using. The microservice will get uh, at least the, the, the git commits of master from webhooks. Um, and we'll, we'll be good. We'll save it, again, in a local cache, in a, in a git ignore. And we will be able to just run it. OK, so the, the pros are that we get all info in one call from the server. So we don't need to do a lot of git ls remote. We have less logic in the client code, which means it's much easier to distribute and, and update this. Uh, it enables shallow sense, which is a huge Git uh, optimization. So Git does not allow shallow clone. But there are a few workarounds. One of them is shallow sense. And if you do Git LS remote, you don't have the timestamps that you need. If the, the server is the source of truth, then it can hold that. Local cache allows for offline work. And it avoids round trip for every Bazel build. Additionally, this allows for various tracking strategies. So the server is the source of truth, so it can decide, for example, that if we don't want to do head dependency. Maybe we want to do stable. Maybe we want to do stable only for a few server, or only for a few info repositories that we want to make sure that don't impact all of the things. But let's have all, like, fifth, for you know, like 40 of the 50 repos be head dependency. What are the cons? So the second party versions are out of sync with VCS, right? It's just in the server. Now, building a system to manage the state of all branches in all repos is not that nice, but more importantly, exposing it to developers with the UI and telling them, hey, you know what? Go to that UI to update the pointers and play around with that is not something any developer wants to do. Uh, additionally, it requires online connectivity for many more use cases. You open a new branch, and now the server needs to tell you to, to create it, and so on and so on. And we really like coding on the airplane at Wix. So we basically we send people just on the airplane just to code. So <laughs> this is a strong requirement of us. OK, so we said, you know what? Let's, let's think about Git, because maybe that can help us and store all, all that information. So we said, you know, OK, so how will that look? Uh, we'll just have the version files tracked by Git. And if you create a new branch, then we'll create a new file uh, using Git hooks. So let's say you check out, you do a Git checkout min minus B, then you check out from a branch, right? That branch has versions. We'll just take that. And this is a local operation. So we create the version file for you, and you can just run. And um, this is tracked, so you can do git commit and git diff and so on and so on. And we have a git hook, another git hook, a different one, that manages the sim link. So basically, so remember the workspace file, it still loads one BZL file. And we have the git hook that changes the sim link according to the current branch. OK, and uh, that's also in git ignore. Now, you might ask, OK, but how do you populate it once, so we have a microservice for other reasons also that has a list of repos. And we do get git ls remote. This is to build the first time ever master version. Additionally, this is something that is used by a CLI tool for developers, right? Because if they want to reset the versions. OK, so what, what's, what's good about that? So uh, mainly it's solving the problems of the custom microservice. So the second party versions are in sync with VCS. They are, they are in VCS. Uh, managing the state is easy. It's in Git, right? We all know Git uh, uh, to, to diff it, to commit, and uh, to, to, to see exactly what's happening in every change. And uh, Git is decentralized, so many of the use cases are now can be local. And it allowed us to have history of, of second party versions per branch per commit. OK, but what are the cons? So only one, but a huge one. The second party versions can be very, very volatile, especially on master. So now, if you want 
uh, developers to manually maintain the master file, then you first have version drift because I don't really want to maintain it. So I will usually you do head dependency. And more importantly, I will have merge conflicts because let's say uh, uh, George and I uh, go from the same commit. Now we both change the same file, the same master versions. Now when I go to commit after him, I have, I have a merge conflict. So that's not really a viable option. But then you can say, you know what, let's automatically maintain it. But then we go back to the same original problem of race conditions and infinite loop breaking. So at this point, we realized that treating master and other branches the same is just wrong. And we need to somehow mix both solutions. So how does this look? OK, so we still have a microservice, and it stores the latest version of master in all repositories. So again, get, gets webhooks from Git. It knows this is the master version. Um, the script calls the microservice to get the master versions of second party. And those are not tracked by Git. So those are resolved every time you work on master. A good use case for working on master is CI. So basically, on CI, we resolve the versions each time from the microservice. We just get uh, a response with the Starlock file. Yes, I wasn't sure I was going to say Starlock. Uh, definitely a mouthful. Um, OK. So, uh, so th that's automatically resolved, and the content is in Git ignore. And the non-master branches are tracked in Git. Now, they are manually curated, and we just added hooks to, uh, oh, yeah, we still have hooks, but they are different. Their purpose is to help you as a developer uh, ease the, manually, uh, the manual creation. So for example, let's say you rebase, you pull origin, and now you want to rebase. If you're rebasing, you're taking the code, right? You're taking the code from origin. The code probably depends on other code also on master. So if you rebase, we also want to rebase your pointers. So we have hooks to correlate between the code and the pointers. Now, we, we, sharp, we, we uh, carved that out so that this, this is still semantics very similar to Git. So when Git is online, we will be online. When Git is local, we will be local. And the developer will not, uh, uh, will not really notice. And we still have the Git hook that you know from before. OK, so what are the pros of this? So, we don't get merge conflicts, we don't get version drift, and we don't get race conditions. Really big pains. Additionally, we get all info in one call. So just on a small scale, right, the like five repositories that, that we played around with, given now it's, it's on a developer machine and not on CI, so networking does change, but we got it down from 10 seconds to one second. So 10 seconds with the, with the LS remote, one second with the server. Sorry. Still enable shallow sends because uh, the thing that promotes all of this is, is the server. Um, and we still don't need to pay the round trip. Lastly, the second party versions and VCS are mostly synced. So not for master, but for all other branches. Uh, still allows for offline work and still supports tracking strategies. What are the cons? So we need to clean up old second party versions, right? Because we just keep on committing those files. OK, but that's actually a problem also with Git branches. So just hap so happens that we have a service that actually uh, prunes out old branches that aren't really needed. And we just made that service also clean up those files. OK, uh, the client is not that thin, right? Price of doing business, right? That's just the cost of doing business. We will find ways to uh, distribute that, which will be uh, relatively cheap. Auditing master. So you'll say, you know what, but you're not tracking master. What do people do? So what we do is we just uh, output in the build, we output the file, and uh, we store that as part of the build output. So uh, for our use case, this is part of, uh, this is just a target in Bazel. And then the developer, if they want to reproduce a, a build of master, they can go, they download that file, and they run it. And that's it. They just get reproducibility also on master. So it's not tracked by Git, and it's like two clicks away, but they, but they have it. 
Lastly, people, some, people might need to understand this master versus non-master logic. Um, but I think that the, 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 the main takeaway is that these cons are operational and small scale. They are not functional. Like previously, all of our iterations were, you know what, this will not work. You know what? This will usually work, and sometimes people will be really, really mad and, 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 and saying, hey, get your stuff together. So uh, all in all, net, we're really happy to get it down to operational issues. Um, yeah, some more thoughts. This, this is like the, the advanced. I'm not sure I'll touch on everything, because I think um, it's a bit too much. But uh, so first of all, what, what, what's the version? Um, because you have many repos, so there is not really a version, right? There is not, if you have a monorepo, you have a version. So for us, the version is the aggregate of all commits. So this version list is the version that you want to, to speak about, because this represents the code that, that was used. Uh, what, what should the server respond? Should it respond with JSON, Starlark, both? So we started with JSON, but then we said, you know what, this means that the client is, again, uh, like a lot wiser because it needs to format the, the Git repository. If we want to change to HTTP archive, which we're actually considering, then the client needs to be changed. So we said, you know what, we just return both. <laughs> we, the Starlark file is, uh, is, is taken by the script and is used by Bazel. And we use the JSON for other stuff on our CI that propagate it. And basically, um, this again is the lock. This is not the lock, but this is the identifier of the code, uh, the JSON response. Uh, ordering. How do you do ordering in many repo head dependency? Like, wh wh what's first? So, uh, so we said, you know what, let, 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 let's just take the committer time. But then we said, well, committer time of what? Of the repo? But maybe you were triggered by another repo, right? Because they merged to master and now you were triggered. Your, your, your time did not change. OK, so we just took the max committer time of all repos, because that's the latest one. But then we found out that actually uh, committer time is not that good. Because when you do a rebase, committer time changes. When you do a merge, committer time changes. When you do git cherry pick, committer time does not change. So thankfully, uh, we use GitHub. GitHub has a pushed at uh, timestamp. So we just use the pushed at. And this max pushed at timestamp is what we use for ordering. Uh, I hope their, time, their, their clock will not get out of sync, or we will have problems. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, I think yeah, one, last, one last thing is basically why we chose to encode all of Wix repositories in, in the same, um, in that file. Because maybe not everything needs everything, right? So uh, we actually did, not, in our current system, we don't do that. And we built a separate system that tries to understand the dependencies between uh, modules, here it's, it's repositories, and uh, we did not want to go into that avenue of saying what repo needs what repo, uh, because the whole external repository story, workspace.resolved, and uh, recursive workspaces is very much, um, I think it, it's not in the dark now, but it was uh, like six months ago, seven months ago, it was much more in the dark. And we said, you know what? We don't want to build a system uh, that might not be relevant. So we will just use that, and we will optimize along the way. Because basically, this is just cloning. Um, and it will all, all, all only happen if you, know, if you actually need it. Thank you.